So I was debating what to call this. I, I probably should call this uh, first message, Never Say Never. Uh, for many years, we had a guy in our church that was a Hollywood script writer, and he used to always tell me, look, Pastor Tom, why don't we, uh, why don't we put you on TV? Why don't we video you? Why don't we post videos? So I'm never doing that. That's ridiculous. I don't want to be on TV, and I don't want to be on any videos. And so um, I think it's a hereditary defect in my family. But uh, having said that, uh, here we are, and I'm making my first video because we're kind of trapped. Our governor has made it a criminal offense to go to church here in Virginia. And so um, I'm going to give it a shot with the YouTube video. And I've been debating and praying and, and really thinking about a lot what I was going to say and what I was going to talk about. I feel like the Lord gave me a message a couple of weeks ago that I preached live at the church that I, I, I want to pick up on and spend quite a bit more time on it. I was living in crazy times, we're living in chaotic, confusing times. Not that I think probably most of history has been chaotic and confusing, but right now for most of us, it's, it's very chaotic, very confusing times. And um, I don't think we realize how much of our world is shaped by what we believe, how we see and perceive the world. See, the problem is the, the world around us, to a large extent, was shaped by others. What do I mean by that? I, I mean that from the time we're a child, others input into us and others shape how we think, how we see, how we, how we perceive the world around us. Uh, I remember when I was a kid, my grandmother in Germany used to always tell me you couldn't eat fresh fruit with ice cream. It would give you a bad stomach ache and it was bad for you. And so I, I took that as gospel for years. I wouldn't dream of eating any fruit with ice cream because I didn't want a stomach ache. Well, one day I, I, I had this crazy thing called a banana split. And it had bananas in it that was a fruit. And I realized I didn't have a stomach ache afterwards. And then I started experimenting with pineapples on my ice cream and cherries on my ice cream. You know what I discovered? I didn't get a stomach ache from eating fruit with ice cream. And yet I probably spent 25 years of my life refusing to do so because I believed that that was bad for you. I believed that was going to cause me a problem. Well, I believe that because somebody else gave me that thought as a child. And we, and we have... All of us are shaped, not, with, not just by our childhood, but by the world around us, by our friends in school. And how many of us dress the way we do? I remember years and years ago, Carol and I were in the Charlotte airport. We're on our way to, to a conference. And in the Charlotte airport, they have this long hallways with, with loads of rocking chairs. We're sitting in a rocking chair. We're watching the crowd go by. And there's this guy who goes by. And it looked like he was maybe in his 50s, and he had bleached blonde hair, kind of spiked up. And uh, I'll call it a 70s disco shirt, and this was not the 70s, this was the 2000s. He had a 70s disco shirt that was open most of the way down, and you could see the hair on his chest. He had, a, had gold disco chains, these like tight uh, pants, uh, I, I don't remember what the material, polyester pants. And uh, he's walking down the airport, and I'm looking at him, and I told Carolyn, I said, you know, the funny thing is, he thinks he looks cool. He wouldn't, nobody would dress that way if they realized how silly they looked. I thought he looked silly. Carolyn thought he looked silly. I suspect most of the people thought he would look silly, but he thought he looked cool. Why did he think he looked cool? Because somewhere down the road in his past, somehow he equated that dress with cool and, and attractive and desirable. He... He was somehow, we would say maybe he was stuck in the 70s or stuck in the 80s. Well, the reality is he was stuck in a, in a, a thought pattern in his mind. And so many of us, the things that we do, the things that we say, the things that we operate in, the way that we think has been shaped by all of our society, by our culture. I, I, I shared this a couple of weeks ago in church. I'll, I'll point it out again. Just the way we drive, our, our society, our advertising industry controls how we drive. I mean, what does everybody in America want to drive? SUVs. Why does everybody want to drive SUVs? Because SUVs are cool. Why do, what, does nobody want to drive a minivan? Why does nobody want to drive a minivan? Because minivans are uncool. Who wants to drive a minivan, a soccer mom? If we step back and are objective and honest, a minivan is a more efficient better designed, better laid out, better vehicle. It just is. Look, I don't drive a minivan and I'm not interested in driving a minivan. I've been influenced by the culture too. I drive a car. 
I drive a Volkswagen Passat. But um, the, the reality is you couldn't catch most people dead in a minivan now. Why? Because minivans are uncool, undesirable, and they send a message about you that you are a loser or a failure or a soccer mom or something. And so everybody buys SUVs that get terrible gas mileage and, and, and are, are inefficient. No hauling space in the back if you, if you use all the seating, et cetera. I could spend the rest of this message just touting the benefits of minivans over SUVs. I'm not going to do that. But I am going to point out the way we dress, the way we think, what we drive, where we live, how we live. So much of that was influenced from the world around us. Others put that into us. Uh, I remember when my kids were little, we used to always, one of the best TV shows or, or best videos we had was Winnie the Pooh. And used to love watching Winnie the Pooh with my kids. And, and over time, those sayings that Winnie the Pooh had became my sayings. And so many times now, you know, my wife and I will catch ourselves you know, we got something we need to decide and we'll go like poo and one of the scenes goes think 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 and I'll do that I'll catch myself going think 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 or I'll ask Carolyn for a, a piece of pie and she'll go well, how big a piece do you want and I'll say well just a small helping and then she'll bring me a little sliver of pie and then I quote poo uh, well I meant a, a little larger small helping and I realize how much my kids constantly quote this TV show called The Office. I mean, they quote lines. They, they, they can have an entire communication by quoting lines from the TV show The Office. Carolyn and I quote Winnie the Pooh, Willy Wonka and his Chocolate Factory, uh, the original good one with Gene Wilder, not, not the, the new, trunk, new trash. But the reality is thoughts and the way we think are influenced in a lifetime of data that we receive, how we perceive our country. I mean, we're in this battle right now with coronavirus. What do you believe? What do you believe about it? What do I believe about it? Well, it's to a large extent, it's going to be influenced by what we were taught and what we were trained and how we were trained to think. You know, if you come from a family of trust everything the medical profession tells you, oh gosh, well, the medical profession let me stop right there. Some of the medical profession has told us, oh, it's life-threatening. Everybody who gets it's going to drop dead. You know, this is worse than the Black Death, the bubonic plague of the Middle Ages. Oh, my God, this is horrible. And then there's others that say, you know, are more circumspect and, and say, well, hold on. Let's look at the statistics. Oh, statistics. We don't care about statistics. You hate humans. You want people to die. And so there, there's these, these extreme attitudes and extreme ways of thinking. And people don't even realize why they do it. Why do they do what they do? Why do they run and buy all the toilet paper? You know, why can't we get any toilet paper? Why is that the thing? Or milk? Or you know, why? Well, people don't know. They don't know why they're doing that. It's something in their thought process, something in their way they think and perceive and see the world that caused them to do that. I just, I just read this past week a, a, a disturbing and disappointing study. Uh, Barna, uh, George Barna's organization, just recently did a, a survey of Christians, and they concluded that only about 6% of evangelical, born-again Christians in America have a biblical worldview. What do I mean by that, a biblical worldview? Or actually, we rephrase that. What do they mean by that? A biblical worldview. Well, a biblical worldview is a worldview that I see the world in alignment with the Scripture. For example, I'll give you just a little simple example. The Scripture says all men are evil and sinful and will die in their sins unless they repent and accept Jesus. But the, the, the biblical concept is that all men are born and steeped in sin. That sin and wickedness. The scripture says there's an unrighteous, no, not one, talking about man's righteousness, man's heart, man's desire towards evil. Now that's the biblical, that is the biblical worldview. Now a lot of people say, well, Pastor Tom, that's so negative, that's so, that's so old-fashioned. I believe most people are good. In fact, the reality is most people believe they are good. If you ran a test, and ask the average person on the street, are you a good person? Our, our Puritan forefathers 
would have said, absolutely not. I'm a sinner, which is another message for another day. But they would have perceived themselves as sinful. The modern American Christian and the modern American heathen perceive themselves as good, perceive themselves as righteous, perceive themselves as holy in themselves, in their own ability. That's not a biblical worldview. It's not a biblical worldview that, well, all people are good. No, they aren't. No, they aren't. In fact, Jesus said that there's two children. There's children of God and children of the devil. But that's so judgmental. That's so harsh. And so we, we've adopted views and ways of thinking that are contrary to the Scripture. If you think about the word iniquity, not a word we use. I mean, when's the last time you used the word iniquity? I bet nobody used it this week. Iniquity. What is iniquity? Iniquity is twisting or turning. And the reality is we practice iniquity in our way of thinking all the time. I'll give you an example of an iniquity. What is iniquity? Iniquity is to simply say, my way, the way I think about this, the way I do this is kinder, nicer, better than the way God does it. I am kinder than God. I am nicer than God. I am more compassionate than God. Use an example. I was just reading in Timothy this, this morning, and Paul wrote Timothy. They, they had, uh, uh, we'll call it an internal church system for taking care of those in need. And one of those things that they took care of was widows. And Paul's writing Timothy, he said, but in order for the widows to be taken care of, they have to have had a reputation for good works, had been servants in the church. In other words, they had to have be contributors. If they were not net contributors to the church, then when they wind up a widow, don't put them in the, in the system of providing for them. Now we go, oh, that's cold, that's harsh. That's, that's God's system. But, you know, we live in a culture where we've got to help everybody. We have to give money to everybody. If you don't want to work, we give you money. And Carol and I were just watching a, a, a YouTube video the other night, uh, John Stossel, and, he, and it was about freeloaders and, and the people that beg on the street. And they, they actually went up and were talking to these people that were begging on the street, offering them jobs, because a lot of them have the little sign, we'll work for food. And so the, the camera crews, look, we have a jobs, we, have this, we need some grass cut over here, we need this done, we need that done. What they discovered is uh, nine out of ten people weren't the least bit interested in actually working, so they just wanted somebody to give them money. Now, we all think we're compassionate when we give them money. We all think, well, I'm being compassionate, I'm being soft-hearted, I'm being like Jesus. And yet the Scripture says, if you refuse to work, you shouldn't eat. Well, that's cold, that's harsh, that's iniquity. See, that's the point. The point is, you and I, we don't realize just how much this world has changed how we think. And I think, I, I don't think, I know, we would be appalled if we realized just how Babylonian our thought processes were, just how, how worldly, if we want to use that world, our thought processes were. You know, the problem God had when He brought the Israelites out of Egypt, out of 400 years of slavery, and He brought them out of Egypt and tried to take them into the Promised Land, they couldn't go. They couldn't go into the Promised Land. No, why could they not go into the Promised Land? Well, the reality is they, they're, they're thinking. They had been slaves for so long that they thought of slavery as the normal way to be. Remember the first, first time they have a crisis. What do they say? We'd be better off as slaves. Really better off as slaves? Well, we think about the wonderful food. They're, they're worried that they're not going to have food. God's about to give them manna from heaven, but they're worried they're not going to have food. Well, we'd be better off eating the leeks and onions that we had in in Egypt, oh yeah, we'd be better off eating onions. Come on, man, onion breath, shut up. You know, have onions and garlic, and, and we'd, we'd be better off as slaves. That doesn't make sense to anybody who hasn't been a slave. If you haven't been a slave, you're going, that's crazy. Why would anybody say we would be better off going back as slaves? But in their brain, 400 years 
of being slaves made being a slave the most normal thing they could imagine, made being a slave the most normal thought process. And the problem that, I, that the Lord had at the end of the day, getting them into Egypt, or getting them out of Egypt and getting them into the Promised Land, is he got them out of Egypt, he got them to the border of the Promised Land, but he could not get Egypt out of them. Their Egyptian way of thinking, their slave mentality, their slave approach to life. And what this, I'm starting a series here, you know, people go, are you going to open the Bible? <laughs> we'll get there, we'll get there. But um, the series that I'm going to, that I'm starting here today, and, and we'll see what it looks like on YouTube, is uh, I'm going to talk for a while on a, on a word, repentance. And, and that word yeah, it has a lot of connotations, a lot of meaning to a lot of people. Typically, though, when you hear the word repent for most people, that word picture, you, and I used to do this too, I, when you hear the word repent, you're, you're picturing the, the, the crazy old guy with the long beard and, and holding up the sign, repent, the end is near. And, and we have all these ideas of what repentance is and what repentance means and, and and most of them aren't good. You know, most of them, we, when we hear the word repent, we don't think of positive things. In fact, I think if I came to you and said, man, I had to repent 25 times today, y'all would think I had a really bad day. And what we're going to discover by the time we're done with this series, that if I repented 25 times today, I might have actually had a very good day, quite possibly. That the 25 times I repented may actually have been a very positive re situation for me. And what we're going to talk about is, is this idea of repentance. So let's define repentance first. What does repent mean? Well, repent means, I'll tell you what it doesn't mean. Let me tell you what it doesn't mean that you probably thought it did mean. Repentance doesn't mean crying and feeling sorry, and we'll get to this, and I'll show you in the scripture. It doesn't mean feeling bad. It doesn't mean beating yourself up. It doesn't mean going and making restitution. It doesn't mean feeling terrible or, or acknowledging how horrible you are. It doesn't mean any of those things. It's the Greek word metanoia. And it simply means a change of mind. Meta is the Greek word for change. Um, we use it in computers, in computer language. A computer file has what's attached to it, what's called metadata. And it's, it's a little secret hidden file you don't see when you're looking at your computer screen, when you're looking at your files in, in Explorer. It, the metadata is the data that shows the changes. When was this changed? Who changed it? Uh, it will store all sorts of data concerning the, the file itself. So we use the word meta in, in computer. Noia, we get neurologists, mind. So, so the Greek word metanoia simply means to change the way you think. See, I was always taught growing up in church, it meant to change your conduct. You know, to turn around, you go in one direction, and repenting means to turn and go the other direction. I've heard that as, a, as an explanation. But what I've discovered is if you don't change your mind... If your mind isn't renewed, you know, it tells us in Romans chapter 12, it says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove out what is God's perfect and acceptable will in your life. See, Paul was writing the Roman church, and he said, listen, conformity to this world will not produce any change in your life. See, you can't repent if you don't change your way of thinking, it's the thinking that's the problem. It's the thinking that causes the issue a lot of times. It's the way that you think. Uh, my wife is, is really big into studying nutrition. And we're always amazed. She's always amazed at me, too. Uh, I, don't, I don't know a lot of it from my own study. I just know it from learning from her. But you know, Carolyn studies a lot on nutrition, and we're always amazed at how many people don't know anything about it. 
They don't know anything about, for example, white refined sugar and how terrible it is for you. And, and, and if you don't know that's true, go Google YouTube, and I'm, uh, Google is the mark of the beast, but for this purpose, it'll be okay. <laughs> if I'm getting ready to put this on one of Google's products, YouTube. Um, but the reality is, white sugar is, is, is terrible for your body in, in a myriad of ways. The white, white refined sugar is destructive to your body. Now, I can tell you all day long, you need to quit eating sugar. You need to change and not eat white sugar. And you can go, okay. I might as well say, you need to wear a red hat and a clown nose. Because it won't make any more sense to you. Oh, yeah, Tom says you shouldn't eat white sugar. But if your way of thinking, well, that's stupid. Tastes delicious. And listen, it does. Briar's ice cream, white sugar in a Briar's ice cream. Oh, my gosh. Nothing tastes more delicious than Briar's ice cream with fruit on top. And uh, <laughs> don't, don't tell my grandma. But anyway, it tastes delicious. So you come up to me and you say, you shouldn't eat that Briar's ice cream. It has sugar in it. And I say, okay. And then you walk away. I'm going to keep eating my Briar's ice cream because what you said to me doesn't make any doesn't make any sense to me. The way I think, my thinking is there's nothing more delicious than Briar's ice cream, and therefore your comment about sugar just it, it goes in one ear and out the other, and it, it doesn't make any sense to me. No metanoia occurred, no changing of my mind. But now. If, on the other hand, you come to me and you, you sit down with me and you explain, for example, what white sugar does and what the refining process is and how they take sugar cane the way God made it and through a whole series of processes, they take out all the good stuff God put into it and all that you're left with is this highly addictive substance that crosses mass, massive problems, insulin issues in your body, it causes arterial problems in your body, it causes um, food addictions, it causes blood sugar spikes, it, and, and I begin to exp you begin to explain to me what white sugar can do to me and does do to me. Now perhaps, perhaps, and I say perhaps, I may have a repentance, I may have a metanoia, I may change my mind about white sugar, I may not, I may say, I don't care, it tastes too good, you know, bring it on. I don't, I'll take my chances with the consequences. That, that, that may be the choice I make, that is the choice a lot of people make. But on the other hand, if I get true information, if I get the truth, remember Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then you become my di disciples indeed, then you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. And, and we're going to get to that in another lesson, but as I get information, that information, true information, as opposed to all the junk I heard around me, as I get true information, now I have an opportunity to have a metanoia, to have a new mind, to renew my thinking, to change how I think. And if I change how I think, if I change my thoughts about ice cream or about sugar, now maybe I'm going to eat a whole lot less Briars because now all of a sudden every time I look at that Briars ice cream, my thinking has changed. I have repented. That repentance, you know, the Bible says it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. And, and we, I mean, we're just scratched the surface. This is going to take a, a series of these these lessons to to really cover this, but. Now that I have all this extra information, my attitude towards Briar's ice cream potentially is different. I potentially have repented metanoia, change of mind, towards sugar, towards ice cream. Now, the other alternative is I say, forget it, and I don't have a change of mind. And so many people hear the gospel, and they don't receive it, and we wonder why. Well, because they didn't have a change of mind. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But all of life is a series of these types of things, decisions. You find out information that 
maybe challenges information you had before, that maybe challenges a belief system you had before. The problem most people have is they're incapable after a certain age of changing how they think. Even salvation, I remember years ago we were at church before we were pastoring, and uh, pastor, <clears throat> there's probably about three or four hundred people in the service, and he asked people to stand up if they had been saved before a certain age. And he asked people to stand up if they'd been saved before age 10. And a large percentage of the congregation stood up. If you'd been saved before age 20, if you'd been saved before age 25, before age 30, you know what we discovered? Very, very, very few people were saved after the age of 30. Not, not none, I mean a few were, but not very many. And, and that really imp impacted me all those years ago. And I realized, you know, when we're younger, when we're in our children and in our teenage years and even in our early 20s and, and maybe early 30s, we still have the potential to change our minds, to renew our minds, to metanoia. The danger comes in that we have a hardening of the brain, if you will. You know how... Sometimes when people get older, they get hardened arteries. Their arteries clog up with all the junk they put in there. And, and you get a hardened artery. Well, for a lot of people, what happens is their brains clog up. And after a while, it becomes very difficult for them to hear something new, to change their way of thinking. Our ways of thinking get deeply rutted, deeply uh, entrenched. And... And the point of these messages is going to be, especially if you're a little bit older, if you're especially like myself who just turned 30-ish, something like that. <laughs> yeah, that's a joke. If there's a congregation here, they'd be laughing. I'm sitting in a room by myself. This is, this is a little weird. But um, as you get older, people like myself... One of the things that I always admired, I had a law partner, John Deal. John had a, had a powerful ministry, Insight to Freedom. I highly recommend if you, if you can get a, a listen to his messages. John wound up supernaturally $6 million in debt, and, and, and God delivered him, and God showed him 12 steps that I remember the first time I, I listened to his, his teachings really impacted me. But there's a point to all of this. I went to work, I came out of law school when I was over 30, and I went to work, Mr. Deal hired me, John Deal hired me, and I, I went to work with him, and for him, and then ultimately with him, and we would sit sometimes in the conference room and debate theology, and I say debate, discuss theology, and Mr. Deal has very strong beliefs on, on how he saw things, how he believed things. But one of the things I discovered is this man with the point where he hired me was over 50 years old. And we would have conversations and I would watch him change his mind. One of the things that I knew he was a man of God was I very few people I know over 50, you can change your mind on anything. Most people I know over 30, you can't change their mind. You can tell them, you can tell them over and over and over and over again, and they don't care. I don't care. It's this way, and I don't want to hear it. And one of the things that impressed me about John Deal all those years, we'd sit in the conference room. One, one debate in particular we had was church leadership structure. And John was, at this point, sat on the board of 20-plus churches or oversight board of 20-plus churches, was, was invited to churches all the time to speak. And we had... Probably six months or a year, we were debating church government, church structure. And um, I'll never forget, John, at one point, he said, you know, I, I've been wrong. I have totally approached this incorrectly. I've been wrong on how I thought about all of this. And, and he actually, this was a man in his 50s, wrote a letter to every church he had spoken at and repented to them. He said, I have taught this about church leadership and church organization and church structure, and I've been wrong. And I have changed my mind, and here are the biblical reasons. Here's what the Bible says on the subject. Here's what the Scripture teaches on the subject. And, and he wrote these pastors, and I thought, what a man of God. What a man of God to, that you have taught. You are, you are respected. You speak to thousands of people. You've spoken all over the world. 
to say it in your 50s, I taught you something wrong and I am going to correct it. To change your mind about what was a fundamental belief. Most people can't do it. But the reality is if, if we're ever going to get from Egypt into the promised land, we're going to have to do this. We're going to have to learn how to metanoia. And so that was a giant introduction. I don't know how long I've already gone. The beauty of this is, Carolyn said, you can just go and go and go and go, and we can just cut it into pieces. So I, I don't know if I've gone three minutes or, or 23 minutes, but let's go to Mark chapter 1. I wrote all my verses down. Um, sorry I can't put them on your screen. We're, I, I think I have that capability, but if I can just get the video done, I will be impressed with myself and get it posted. Um, we will try and resolve the how to get scripture on the screen in, a, in some, maybe in some subsequent videos. Mark chapter 1, verse 14. Now in Mark 1, 14, it says something really interesting. It says, after John was put into prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. So Jesus, it says, John is thrown into prison and Jesus comes preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Now, gospel, we all know, I, I say we all know, let's stop for a moment so that we make sure we all know what the word gospel means. It's just the Greek word for good news. It says Jesus came, he came into Galilee, he came into Israel, and he came preaching the good news of the kingdom of God. Now, this is not today's message, but the good news in the kingdom of God, he, he preached it in Luke chapter 4, he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Listen, not good news to the poor that you get to stay poor. Recovery of sight to the blind, that's just not physically blind, it's spiritually blind. He said to bind up the brokenhearted, to set at liberty them that are captives, the, to preach the favorable year of the Lord which probably we won't get to in this message, but the favorable year of the Lord is going to mess up your American way of thinking if you're watching this in America or in most of the Western world. He said, I'm here to preach good news about the kingdom of God. And so it says he went, John is thrown into prison, Jesus starts his ministry, and his ministry is preaching good news. So as John 1.14, he said, he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom saying. So now we're about to find out what's the good news. What is the good news? Well, the good news is you get to accept Jesus and then you won't go to hell. That's what we, that's what a lot of us have been preaching. Well, not me, but a lot of churches have been preaching this for a very long time. Well, the gospel is accept Jesus and, you know, the, the, pray the magic prayer, repeat after me, Jesus be my Lord. And now you don't have to go to hell. That that's the gospel. Well, let's see. Let's look and see what Jesus actually was preaching. What he because it's actually there's going to be some quotation marks in Mark 1:15. It says in 14, preaching the good news of the kingdom, saying, "The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news." Now, what an odd thing to say. The good news, you get to believe it. Well, what he was telling us, he's giving us the good news. The good news, the good news of the gospel, my brother and sister, my friend, is you get to repent. Repentance is the gospel. In fact, I will tell you, you cannot get born again without repentance. You can't get saved without repentance. I don't know, we, I know we don't preach it, and a lot of people, and now your, your religious brains are going, Oh, yeah, you got to feel sorry for your sin. No, and stick with us. Keep watching these videos as we go along. Repentance is the key. See, we want a Christless gospel, and we want a repentance-free gospel, and those don't exist. We have to repent. In order to get born again, you're going to have to have a change of mind. You're going to have to change your mind that says, I am going to be my God or money's going to be my God, or my career's going to be my God, or my family's going to be my God, or drugs are going to be my God. You have to have a change of mind and say, Jesus is going to become my Lord. I'm going to accept what He did for me. See, 
He, he calls the gospel one of repentance. Repentance is the key to the gospel. It is the door through which all the good news flows. Without a, a change of mind, you cannot have a change of life. You know, there's a saying, I, I, uh, Joseph Prince uses it all the time. I believe it, it perhaps came from Charles Spurgeon. And it says, right believing leads to right living. And that is an accurate statement. Right believing is what leads us to live correctly. If we don't believe correctly, if I believe white sugar is healthy, I'm going to eat way too much of it. And it's going to lead to a wrong way of living. But I think there's another component to that. Right believing leads to right living. But where does the right believing come from? Right thinking, metanoia, repentant thinking leads to right believing, which leads to right living. So you can't believe correctly. Paul put it this way in Romans. He said, who has believed our report? But then he said, how will they believe without somebody preaching it to them? So it is the, the preaching of it that gives the person, the hearer, information that impacts their thinking. And if they then change the way they think, it will change the way they believe, and then they will accept Jesus, if we're talking about the born-again experience. It will transform how they live. And so it's interesting to me that the gospel, it says repent and believe the gospel. You can't believe the gospel unless you repent first. You have to have a renewed mind. You have to have a, a renewed way of thinking. You know, one of the things that, that I'm chuckling over is, is the coronavirus. So I, I've, I've read on, on some Christian websites and Christian people, oh, it's judgment of God. You know, Jesus addressed this 2,000 years ago. Is this, you know, was or hurricanes a judgment of God or tornadoes a judgment of God or is whatever the judgment of God? Is coronavirus a judgment of God? You know, is, is he judging New York because they got more of it than where I live? Well, Jesus actually, turn over to Luke chapter 13. In Luke 13, Jesus, Luke 13, verse 1, uh, Jesus addresses a, a couple of disasters of that day. Now, there was present at that time those who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Pontius Pilate, the, the Roman governor, had taken some Jews, apparently, and executed them and mingled their blood. You know, they were doing the animal sacrifices at this time in, in compliance with the Levitical law. And um, apparently Pilate had slaughtered a bunch of them and poured their blood in with the animal sacrifices. I mean, you're talking horrific blasphemy here. And Jesus answered them and said, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered such things? In other words, did this bad thing happen to them because they were worse than everybody else? Verse 3, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower of Siloam fell and killed them. Do you think they were worse sinners than all those who dwelt in Jerusalem? But I tell you no, that unless you repent, you will likewise perish. See, he said, do you think these catastrophes happened? Do you think these people died? This tower, apparently a tower collapsed and killed 18 people. And, uh, you know, we think, we think of the World Trade Center. Well, proportionally to the number of people that lived in Jerusalem, and that tower that fell, those 18 probably proportional were very similar to the 3,000 that died when the World Trade Center towers fell, you know, it's compared to the number of people living in New York. And, and, I, and yet, World Trade Center, was it the judgment of God? Was it, you know, is it God sending us a sign? Um, I, don't, I don't know who flew those planes into those towers, but Jesus dealt with the spiritual issue up underneath. He said, do you really think that's the problem? Do you really think the tower falling on him is the problem or them being executed by, problem, by Pilate is the problem? He said, no. He said, unless you repent, unless your way of thinking changes, 
you will likewise perish. Now, was he saying Pilate was going to execute them and towers were going to fall on them? No. Likewise, how? The, this world, listen, this, this may shock you, but the world is full of junk. It's full of sin. It's full of disease. It's full of violence. It's full of wickedness. None of that from God. If you don't know that, go on our website and listen to the messages where I talk about, I have an entire series uh, about the goodness of God, and the God had nothing to do with any of that stuff. So God didn't, didn't cause those things, but our world is full of them. Violence and destruction and death and misery and decay and disease and coronavirus and bird flu and swine flu and, and SARS and Zika and plague and, oh, we could go on and on, and violence and towers falling and earthquakes and hurricanes. Jesus said, this stuff's going to happen. But you know what he told believers? He said, see to it that your heart's not troubled. You don't need to, you don't need to worry about it. See, what he was telling these people was, unless you change your way of thinking, the world's going to get you. You're in, you're, in a, you're, you're in Egypt. You're a slave in Egypt. And, and the, the consequences of slavery are going to destroy you. Well, the world is a slave to sin, and the consequences of slavery are going to destroy them. The consequences of the slavery they're in are going to kill, steal, and destroy them. He said, unless you have a renewed mind, a changed mind, unless you repent, you're likewise, you're going to suffer the same junk because you're trapped in their system. You're trapped. Remember what he's preaching? He's preaching the kingdom of God. He's preaching another way. Not, in fact, let me take that back. Another place you can live. See, the kingdom of God, you can live in the kingdom. You and I, brother and sister, can live in the kingdom of God right here, right now, on this planet, in this virus-infested world, in this disease, politically corrupt world. We can live in a kingdom that's not corrupt, where our ruler is, is wonderful and righteous and benevolent and kind where there's peace, righteousness, peace, and joy. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. The kingdom of God is full of healing. The kingdom of God is full of blessing. The kingdom of God is full of righteousness and health and, and kindness and peace, shalom, peace. The kingdom of God is available to us. It's the promised land. But if we're ever going to transition out of Egypt, and into that promised land, into the kingdom of God, we are going to have to engage in repentance, metanoia, a change in the way we think, a change in the way we see the world, a change in the way that we approach reality. Now, I, I, I feel like I just barely introduced this. I feel like I just scratched the surface, and, and I apologize. I actually thought I was going to have a hard time here but, but I catch myself staring into this little screen, just rambling. But over the next few weeks, Lord willing, we're going to, to begin to take this apart and begin to show you from the Scripture. The Bible calls repentance a gift. And, and we'll get to that. I'll show you, I'll show you in, in next week or the week after. It's a gift. It is the gift of God. It is the blessing of God. You don't have to think. And I don't have to think like they think. You and I aren't trapped in their death, misery ways of thinking. We're not trapped in their poverty mindset. We're not trapped in their bondage. He is telling us, if because unless you repent, let's put it a better way, let's put it in a positive. If you repent, you won't likewise perish. If you change your way of thinking, if you metanoia, you will not perish the way they perished. You will not suffer what they suffered. In fact, it tells us in Revelation 18, come out from among them, my people, so that you don't suffer what they suffer. Don't live like they live and don't think like they think. And we as born-again believers have got to make up our mind. And there's a, there's a quote I, I researched today. I, I would attribute if I could, but nobody knows who said it. But, but I love the quote. In a time of universal deceit, speaking the truth is a radical act. And brothers and sisters, it's time for me and you not only to hear the truth, but to speak the truth and to live in the truth. Jesus told Pilate, I came to bear witness of the truth. And Pilate said, what is truth? 
Well, over the next few weeks, we're going to talk about what is truth and what is the proper way for a Christian to think and a born-again believer to think and what is a proper Christian mindset. Because the Bible says the mindset on the Spirit is life and peace. And so, brothers and sisters, I, I hope you enjoyed this first video. We will, we will continue to make them, Lord willing. And uh, I pray God's blessing upon you. I pray His peace upon you, that you be the head, not the tail this week, that you be above and not beneath, that everything you touch prosper, that everywhere you go, God's blessing be upon you, that His grace, His unmerited favor, overflow you grace upon grace beyond you this week. In Jesus' name, amen.